A lot of issues I'm looking forward to discussing, so, so let's get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Ari Pesco, Director of the Electricity Law Initiative at Harvard Law School. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, you've probably seen recent headlines. New York Times, a new surge in power use is threatening U.S. climate goals. Washington Post, amid explosive demand, America is running out of power. From my vantage point, these headlines reflect repeated miscalculations. Those who fought the future now regret not planning for it. I'm pleased today to be joined by decision makers from four states that have been planning for the future with forward-thinking energy policies that embrace technological progress. Keith Hay is the Director of Policy at the Colorado Energy Office. Catherine Peritik is a commissioner at the Michigan Public Service Commission. Doug Scott is the chair of the Illinois Commerce Commission. Joseph Sullivan is vice chair of the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission. Uh, we'll put their bios in the chat in a moment. Um, thank you to our four panelists for joining us today to share your expertise. Uh, so let's dive in and discuss how your states are advancing the public interest amidst these shifting dynamics for electric utilities. I want to start with reliability. That's, of course, issue number one. Keeping the power flowing is a team sport. Uh, numerous entities take on various responsibilities across timescales, ranging from long-term infrastructure development to real-time operations. To help orient us in this discussion, can you talk about the most important job that states have in maintaining a reliable power system? And I'll start with uh, Chair Scott. Thanks, Ari. Great to be with you and all my friends on the on the panel. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, I think the most important thing that we can do as states is is to uh, help to get the incentives right to balance the the reliability and sustainability uh, and clean energy goals that we've that we've got in our state. And as you mentioned, our state has some very aggressive ones. We're not uh, vertically integrated. We're a competitive state, so it's a little more difficult for us because we you know, don't have some of the same uh, resource planning and some of the other tools available that, that some of the other states have. Uh, but what we've tried to do is, is it uh, align the incentives to, to, to plan for uh, reliable clean energy future. And that means things like subsidizing our, our nuclear plants uh, to keep them uh, operating. Uh, that, that's a huge source of power and the largest source of clean energy in our state. Uh, we actually set up a, a, a system where if the nukes are doing very well, they will actually rebate money to uh, Illinois ratepayers, which actually happened a couple of years ago. Uh, but then they will get subsidies in times when the economics aren't right for them. Uh, a lot of work uh, going on to try to uh, make sure re renewable energy uh, is uh, a huge commitment to renewable energy in our state both community solar, uh, rooftop solar, utility scale wind and solar, and also uh, converting old coal plants uh, to solar and storage facilities. So uh, trying to make sure that, that their incentives are there for all of the clean energy sources to be able to work, and as well as doing things like uh, reliability studies, off ramps in case of, uh, of emergency times where we actually need additional power. Uh, and then uh, also things like making sure the interconnection system in, a, in the state works so that all of the new uh, clean energy can get online. So a lot of steps, a lot of different players in the state involved, but it, it basically comes down to making sure that, that people will want to uh, uh, locate clean energy in, in our state. All right, thank you. Let, and let's turn to Commissioner Paratic. Yeah, thanks. Um, so in Michigan, we actually are a vertically integrated state. Um, well, mostly we're actually 10% deregulated, uh, but that's um, that's a, that's another topic for another day. Um, we so so we have a little bit more uh, planning to do around the generation side, and I'll, I'll I'll I think there are probably three big areas that I see as our job for uh, planning for the future of generation reliability of you know resource adequacy, have it making sure that there's enough generation to cover the load. So, um, and I think I think I think that's so. The first is that planning side, and in Michigan we have the ability to uh, to have our utilities file 
IRPs or integrated resource plans. Um, we also have them file distribution plans. So to make sure that the distribution system is, is ready for the, uh, the, the changing load as well. And also we just started filing transportation electrification plans too. So getting all three of those types of plans to coordinate together. But through that uh, that IRP planning process is really where we we find the um, you know the biggest usage of, uh, of of you know getting getting that getting everything right like getting getting the plans in place for the future and those IRPs we plan five ten fifteen and up to twenty years into the future to make sure that there's enough generation to meet the expected load. The second piece is actually accurately evaluating the investments and projections that the utilities are uh, are making via these rate cases, and then holding the utilities accountable to these planned investments. What what did they uh, what did they plan on doing? How are they are they uh, actually maintaining the system properly? And is there reliable operation of both the generation and the distribution systems? And gathering enough data, checking, holding accountable. And then the third is really acting as a convener and requiring discussion and cooperation among the parties who are involved. So um, that's that's one of the one of the biggest tools that I think um, is not talked about enough, actually, that public service commissions have the ability to do is force people to get into a room and talk to each other. And uh, when you when you're when you actually do that and when you hold these you know technical conferences or um, uh, or or other sorts of um, workshops um, or work groups. There's uh, a, you can you can get a lot of people talking to each other who who might not always do so uh, naturally, and we we see a lot of really really positive results as um, from those processes. Thank you for that, and I appreciate the uh, mention of accountability, which I think is is so critical here and, and definitely a tool that states have. Keith, I want to turn to you again on this question of uh, the state's role in in reliability. Yeah, thank you, Ari. And, and Colorado, too, is a, is a vertically integrated state. You know, I think a lot of what uh, Commissioner per, uh, Patrick expressed is similar to what we're doing here in Colorado, but, I, but I'd actually take a step back and say that one of the things that we did uh, to help ensure reliability is, is to pass legislative uh, pieces of framework for utility planning. Uh, so for example, you know, in 2019, we adopted a requirement that the, the utilities get to an 80% greenhouse gas emissions reduction by 2030. And so that gave us uh, that legal framework for our non-PUC jurisdictional utilities, as well as giving guidance to our public utilities commission around what they need to look for in what we call electric resource planning, what other places call integrated resource planning. And so it's, I think the first thing that we did was begin to set up that framework. And that was not just the requirement for emissions reductions on the generation side, uh, but similarly requiring the utilities to do transportation electrification plans, distribution system plans. Uh, we now have here in Colorado, what we refer to as clean heat plans. And so that's actually a requirement for our gas LDCs uh, to begin to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And, and we are working through the process of how that will impact uh, the electric side of the, the ledger. And so creating that, that legal framework was an important first step. And of course that then really flows into all of the different plans uh, that the utilities have to bring forward. Uh, and some of those do go before our public utilities commission, but even for our non-jurisdictional utilities, they're presenting those plans uh, to different state agencies so that we are making sure uh, that we're on track to hit the targets in those plans. And then the, the final piece of that framework for us is we now have all of our utilities doing resource adequacy reporting annually uh, to my office. And we are then taking all of that information, aggregating it uh, and sharing it back out uh, to the Public Utilities Commission, to the General Assembly, uh, to other interested stakeholders, trying to make sure that as we're doing that front end planning, we're also doing that back end look to make sure that we're on track with, with resource adequacy as we go forward, um, thinking about the, you know, the potential load growth in the state and are you happy to talk about some modeling that we've done that looks at the future and, and the load growth we might expect as, as part of this conversation. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get into that. I wanna let uh, Commissioner Sullivan jump in here as well on the state's role here is for, for reliability. And thank you, Ari, and thank you for, for having me here on this conversation. I'm looking forward to it. Um, 
in Minnesota, Minnesota, similar to Colorado and Michigan, is a vertically integrated state. And I, where the conversation, you know, hits the the rubber hits the road in Minnesota is really at the resource plan. We we like Michigan do resource planning for um, uh, all well. We do it for our, it's mandatory for our investor-owned utilities and it's advisory for our uh, co-ops and munis. Um, our co-ops and munis though take resource planning from uh, that's done at the commission very seriously though. Um, so I, those are very robust records that are developed around there as well. Um, but we also do, we do IDPs for the distribution plan. We do transportation um, electrification plans as well. We're actually rolling up the transportation electrification plans into IDPs now because there's so much overlap there. And I ultimately the long-term vision is, is that IDP will roll up into the I into the into the resource planning as well. But I think the best way to look at reliability from my perspective is through that resource planning um, frame. And you know, we have the most recent resource plan that we've done that is sticking in my mind is XL Energies. Um, plan. Uh, well, we've, we're in the middle of doing Otter Tails plan right now, but um, XL's plan, it, it's extremely comprehensive. We look at the state's policy framework. We have a hundred percent carbon free energy by 2040 framework in place. We have a conservation framework. Um, we have all the key critical uh, policies uh, as well as an electrification framework that's built into our conservation um, standard but with the resource planning, um, you know, we really scrutinize every hour of the year. So 8760, and we look at what are the resources that are going to be necessary that we have within the four corners of our state, or, or really the zone in MISO that we're in, uh, since we share um, a significant chunk of our um, resources in our state with North Dakota and South Dakota and part of Wisconsin. But we look at what are the resources within our zone, within the four corners of our, our zone that we can deploy. I, I mean, I think that, you know, I look at it from that resource adequacy perspective. Can we serve the, the needs of the state of Minnesota, you know, if the, uh, you know, S hits the fan um, and can we do that within, you know, uh, as needed, within our zone. And that for me is resource adequacy. And if a, if, a resor if a resource plan, a run, doesn't show that we can do that, I just, I pull it out. I don't even wanna look at it. And the last resource plan that we had, uh, you know, we had something like 90 scenarios for Excel. Of those, you know, probably 70 uh, was looking at resources that were outside of the zone. So we just removed those from the stack. Now we're down to 20. And then we just narrow down, you know, based on what is the, what is the, the state policy of the state call for? What do we in our judgment think is important? You know, one, a couple of those plans didn't include the nuclear facilities. And, you know, our view was, is that those nuclear facilities are critical for resource adequacy and ensuring reliability. So now we're down to four or five, and that's how we make that decision. It's 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 extremely uh, resource intensive. There's a lot of modeling that goes on to it, but that for me is once we get to that spot, we've ensured the the policy goals of the state. Uh, we've ensured that the that the utility is going to be reliable, eighty seven sixty, um, and that that's how we that's how I look at reliability is is really through that vantage point and that public process. And then at the end of the day, what we approve um, is going to come back to us through our acquisitions process, and you know the, when the utility is, is out to base implementing that resource plan. So, so I want to zero in on. Uh demand growth, the potential for demand growth. And let me be the first person in this panel to say AI, which I think is now an obligatory uh, term you have to use uh, on one of these panels. And, and just say, um, you know, broadly speaking, I think there's sort of two ways to think about meeting growth and consumption. You can use existing infrastructure more efficiently, or you can invest in new infrastructure. So I'm just wondering, how are you thinking about your policy options for enabling growth? Now, some of you have talked a lot about sort of the planning that goes into it, but what else uh, what are the other policy tools when you're thinking about growth? And let me start again. Let me go back right, right back to uh, Commissioner Sullivan uh, on this one. Sure. Thank you. All right. I, when I think about, I mean, 
I, first of all, just reusing existing infrastructure and making better use of existing infrastructure. One of the things that we focused on on the transmission side in Minnesota is optimizing the existing infrastructure, optimizing the existing transmission, you know, through grid and enhancing technologies, making sure that we're using ambient adjust in line ratings, uh, that we're reconductoring as necessary. Um, our utilities have just recently brought us about $200 million in um, I would call it kind of that low hanging fruit of, you know, uh, grid enhancing technologies. Uh, almost all of those projects don't need to come back to the commission for, I think 17 of the 19 don't have to come back to the commission for approval. So you know, optimizing that existing system to make sure that, you know, we're getting uh, the wind and solar uh, and, you know, storage resources onto the, onto the system as fast as we can. Um, in terms of like future demand growth, what we're seeing, I want to just, I, I, I totally accept that we're going to have a lot of demand growth. I don't think that the sky is falling. We've dealt with demand growth in the past, you know, in the fifties and the sixties, everybody was getting air conditionings and, and, you know, the growth was at seven or eight or 9% per year. I mean, that's significantly more than what we're seeing now. I mean, I'm not, if you have a spot load addition of a thousand or 2000 or 3000 megawatts, that's a lot. I'm not going to say, you know, Minnesota is a, a big system, but it, you know, if you put on a, a, a data center, that's 10% of the entire system, that's a lot. And we got to, we got to deal with that. But first of all, I think we, you know, if we plan for it and we, we have the processes and we use the processes that we have, I think we're going to get through it. And, you know, I, I'm not going to, you know, put my hair on fire, you know, we're, we can deal with this and it's a good problem to have. So that's one thing I want to say. It's a good problem to have. And, you know, we'll plan for it. And we'll, you know, I think that one of the things that we need with uh, with uh, demand growth is we need some more transparency and looks at, you know, what's coming, what's likely to come. Some of the things that I want to see our um, utilities, maybe there needs to be some risk sharing for our utilities because, you know, if a, uh, a small utility, you know, they can't be the one holding the bag if a thousand megawatt load drops out. So maybe there's some risk sharing uh, tools that we need to use. Um, but I, I guess with demand growth, my my view is is that we can deal with it. I'm not. I mean, I'm obviously concerned. I want to make sure that we we get it right. I want to make sure that this load does not island itself, and that the resources that are going. You know, some of these companies are so big, and they they could you know, they can build the generation themselves. I, I don't think that's a good thing for the system. I want to make sure that the system has, uh, it is able to support it. Um, but I, I, and I don't want to go backward on our climate goals. So I, I come back to planning and we can plan for this. So. Uh, Keith, I know you mentioned before you had done some analysis or your office done some analysis. Maybe you could give us a quick overview of what, what you found on, on that. Yeah, happy to, Ari. And I guess I would start by saying in response to the, the initial question, you know, in Colorado, it's going to be both and, you know, it's investing in, in the existing infrastructure and upgrading that. And we know we're going to need new infrastructure. You know, we recently completed a study of a bunch of scenarios that would look at different pathways to getting to a carbon free grid by 2040. Uh, and as part of that, you know, we were showing something around a 40 percent load growth uh, between now and 2040. And so as we looked at that, you know, one of the things we recognized is, yeah, we are going to need, you know, both a lot more wind and a lot more solar. And if we are going to have the levels of wind and solar that the modeling suggests we need, uh, we're going to need additional transmission investment. You know, our Public Utilities Commission here recently authorized XL Energy to build a, a large project here in the state called the Power Pathway. Uh, more than a billion dollar transmission investment, but that's not going to be uh, sufficient to get us out to 2040. And so, you know, we're going to need additional transmission investment. But I think a big part of what we are seeing and, and really where the distribution system planning is going to become essential to what we do is how that load is, is going to look a lot different from load in the past. Uh, you know, I agree with, with Commissioner Sullivan. We've seen, you know, load growth in the past around air conditioners, but I think what's different today is a lot of this may be bi-directional. You know, we expect to see EVs moving power back and forth. We already have solar doing that. We expect, you know, more battery growth on the residential and commercial side. And so doing the planning on the distribution system to understand when and how those new loads and new types of loads 
that the utilities will be able to manage are, are coming at us. And so that's going to be a, a real piece of where we see uh, going forward the need for additional investment. And that's part of why my office has been working uh, over the better part of this last year with some of our utilities, with conservation groups and developers uh, on legislation that would help create a pathway uh, to accelerate the level of investment so that it really does align with the, the need we have for distribution system investment. Great. And let's chair Scott on this one. Demand demand growth yeah. in Illinois. Thank, thank, thanks, Ari. So I agree with everything that Joe and Keith have said, and, and those are very similar to some of the things that we're working on as well. I'll just highlight three other things that, that we're doing in this area. One is you know, part of demand growth is overall demand, and, and we have a huge commitment, and we've just recently redoubled our commitment to energy efficiency uh, as a way to try to curb some of that demand growth that, that we've been having. Uh, also looking at uh, beneficial electrification plans, uh, trying to work with the, the electric utilities as they start to plan out either A, more load growth, uh, just naturally, you know, B, more load growth because of electrifying uh, transportation sector, uh, and then also uh, the, uh, some changes in the building sector where, where there's more electrification going on as well. And then the third part of, of, of that that I wanted to mention is a renewable energy access plan that was also part of the, of the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, which, which asked the commission to look at where not only where are the areas where all of the new renewables that we're building are, are likely to go, what makes the most sense for that, but also where the additional transmission that's going to be needed uh, could also go in the state. And the idea, as Keith said, is to try to see if we can expedite that and, and make sure that, that, we're, that we're doing as much planning in advance as we can to try to uh, make sure that the renewables and the, and the transmission that we're going to need uh, are actually uh, in place and, and, can, and can happen uh, as they're needed. Commissioner Peritik? Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll just, uh, I'm not going to repeat everything that everyone else has said. You all did a, a fantastic job of answering this question. I'll just add one piece um, in addition to agreeing with everything else. Um, and and that's on uh, the need to adjust our projections regularly too. So we need to take the projections that we have now. Don't base every everything on all of this hype that we're hearing around the data centers, around AI, around around all of that. It's it, you know it's important, but we shouldn't be making our decisions based on hype. We need to make, be making our decisions based on data. We need to take those projections take that data and then compare them to the actuals of what we're actually seeing and make our decisions based on the estimates and and also and also making sure that that data is transparent so so we can um we can rely on other people checking our work too and also check to make sure that um the those decisions that we made align with um you know with history with what we've seen um, so some of the audience members have figured this out already, but there is a Q&A feature and you can type in uh, some questions. We are monitoring that and uh, I have about, I believe, three or four hours more questions here for our panelists and then we'll try to get in uh, some Q&A from everyone else. Um, so I want to look back a little bit. So um, one of the major trends we've seen across the country is a shift away from fossil powered steam turbines. In particular, coal fire generation is down about 65%. Uh, since 2007, and your states have all been part of that trend. So looking back, how has your state managed this dramatic shift? And maybe I'll start here with Keith. Yeah, thank you, Ari. And and it has been and continues to be a, a really dramatic shift. In, in 2010, uh, roughly 68% of Colorado's electricity came from coal. By 2022, uh, I think that was down to about 36 percent. And by 2030, we will have retired our last coal plant in the state. Um, and so that's that's a pretty dramatic shift when you think about, you know, that's over the course of, of two decades. For many of us, that's a single resource plan uh, historically. And so, you know, I think we've done a number of things uh, here. One, I think coming back is that sort of legal and regulatory framework around emissions reduction planning. So putting in place that sort of long-term glide path uh, so that utilities and others know that uh, what's coming ahead of them. Uh, I think another big thing that Colorado has, has done, and, and this may be a little bit outside of an expected answer, uh, is created an office of, of just transition here in the state uh, to work with our utilities and our communities that have supported coal plants over 
you know, many years to figure out what this transition looks like for them and means to them. And so that's been a big part of over the last several years, how we have worked through uh, this transition. You know, I think from the utility perspective, it's really been focusing back as many of the commissioners have said into that electric resource or integrated resource planning process and making sure that we are looking at system reliability. We are looking at the economics uh, of the resource portfolios that we see coming forward. Uh, and, you know, quite honestly, for, for us in Colorado, that's been a really big driver uh, of this transition. I was a commission advisor several years ago when we saw the first retirement uh, for XL Energy of a couple of large coal-fired units. And the commission then found it was a purely economic decision, um, that it, it really wasn't emissions driven, that at the end of the day, it was possible to retire the coal units, bring on new wind and solar, and actually save money for ratepayers. Uh, and so, you know, we've been benefiting from, from that dividend. Um, we are in a new planning environment, but I think, you know, broadly, it's, it's really been focused on that resource planning component as sort of the driver to make sure that we are meeting all of the different state policy goals. Commissioner Peretic? Yeah, so uh, since 2006, Michigan has already retired its 5,509 uh, 5, megawatts of coal generation, which is a, that's a, that's a huge amount of generation for our state. And it's been replaced in, um, in a few ways. It's been primarily replaced with natural gas. That has replaced the majority of it. it that replaced 3,619 megawatts of that um, that 5,500 that I that I mentioned, and then wind, solar, and energy market purchases have replaced the, that remaining 34% um, of the coal retirements. And that's just to date. All of our remaining coal plants are planned to be retired by 2032. Um, and that whole process, looking into the past, has been handled via our existing planning processes, so the IRPs uh, that we do in Michigan, Integrated Resource Planning. And it, it really is a robust process. As I mentioned, it goes from five, five years out to 20 years into the future. And our utilities are required to update it every five years. But what's interesting is that they've actually come in on an average of every three years to update it. So everyone has come in sooner that no one's actually waited that five years in between the, those uh, those resource plans um, because things are really changing quickly. And uh, and I and I think what's one of the really robust pieces to that integrated resource planning is that we get a really broad range of interveners who participate in those cases. And um, and I, I really appreciate you, Keith, mentioning mentioning the importance of the just transition because uh, that's something that we we put a lot of emphasis on as well. Um, so you know, I I really think that uh, you know, utilizing this IRP planning process has put us in a, a fairly um, solid place from the extensive retirements that we've had in the past. And I believe that um, you know, as things are changing, it'll it'll be able to uh, shepherd us through that in the future too. Commissioner Sauvin, why don't you tell us about the, the transition away from coal in Minnesota? Yeah, no, I, I, I uh, it's really interesting listening to um, Colorado and Michigan. I, our story is very similar to, to both of theirs. And I think it's really a testament to the, the power of the resource planning, uh, as well as the vertically integrated utility to deliver on those public policy outcomes. Um, Minnesota right now is 55% carbon free. Uh, we're trending will be 80, 85 percent carbon free by um, 2030. Our last coal power plant will retire in 2030 or 20 or early 2031. Uh, that, that's the Boswell facility. Um, and and, you know, Minnesota in 2005 was largely um, it was coal and, and nuclear. That was what we were. So, you know, within. 25 years, uh, we've transitioned to what will be a, a, a deeply decarbonized uh, system. And what is already, I mean, 55% carbon free. If, if everybody were at 55% carbon free, if every sector were, I'd feel a lot better about the world. Um, so, you know, we are, um, uh, we're, we are um, moving forward uh, very quickly and in, in a very deliberative and thoughtful way. Uh, we have, um, there's just several, uh, I mean, basically we're down to the, the largest coal facilities that are retiring. Sherco, which is Minnesota's largest facility, 
uh, unit one retired earlier this year, and then we'll see unit two and unit three retire uh, later this decade. So um, that's our transition. And I, I am glad to hear uh, the other, one of the things that Minnesota has been very focused on is on host communities and just transition issues. Um, we are, um, I'm actually meeting with uh, in two weeks, uh, an organization that's been pulled together uh, to talk about um, um, host communities and the issues that they face. Some of these communities, you know, are receiving 60, 70% of their um, of their property taxes from those uh, power plants. And they're very vibrant, wonderful places. And, you know, they're looking at their future and, and we've been very deliberate in how to um, work on those and work on those issues. Uh, Excel Energy has been particularly good in, in trying to attract new business to them. But a part, of, I think a big part of that is we, we see the runway. Um, and we know, you know, we know how long we have to act. We're not just shutting down a plant tomorrow and, and saying, okay, you're, you're into your new world. So we're not doing that. So it, it's been um, a successful. I, I know for a lot of those communities, they are, are struggling and it's a challenge, especially Cohasset, which is in Northern Minnesota, but it's something we're working on very deliberately. And uh, Ch Chair Scott. Yeah, thanks, Ari. Well, Illinois is an interesting uh, position because not only do we have the clean energy goals and, and moving away from, from coal, uh, but we're also a coal producing state traditionally. And so those just transition issues that everyone has talked about, especially important uh, for us because we not only have uh, communities where the plants were located, but also mining communities uh, that had several generations of 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 uh, families that were supported by that industry. And so the just transition pieces for us, are extremely important. And there's a large section in the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act that, that deals with lots of different uh, uh, things to try to, to, to try to ease that a little bit for the, the, the coal communities. Um, we've got a date certain uh, in the in CJ uh, of 2030 uh, for coal plants. Uh, all of the coal plants that we had in the state actually announced prior to CJ being signed that they were going to close before 2030. Um, except for uh, two, and those are municipally owned plants um, who have a requirement that by 2035, they have to reduce their emissions by 45%. It doesn't say how, so that could be CCS, <clears throat> excuse me, that could be uh, through shutting down one of the units. It could be by uh, using renewables or something else to, to supplement uh, uh, the coal uh, uh, generation. Um, and so, and if they don't do that by 2035, then they have to close by 2038. So we've got everybody on a schedule. We did not do a trading program or some other way to do that. CJA actually, because of the of the in, uh, input and, and the and the great um, uh, discussion that we got from the frontline communities uh, in Illinois, the interest was more in having the plants shut down rather than be able to operate under a, you know, buying credits or some kind of trading program. And so we actually have a date certain for all of the coal plants to close. In addition, we have a date certain for all of the gas plants in Illinois to close as well, uh, unless they can show by 2045 that they are 100% uh, emission free, both on criteria pollutants as well as on GHGs. So a really tough standard um, it, that goes beyond coal to also uh, include gas, and those will close in tranches beginning in 2030. And the two main criteria for what closes in those tranches uh, is how clean or dirty a particular plant runs uh, and wh where they're located. So uh, an older, dirtier running peaker plant, for example, that's located in an EJ area or a disadvantaged community, those are the ones that you're going to see that will close first, and then they will close in tranches going forward. So it's a really comprehensive plan, but again, you know, going back to our earlier discussion also puts additional pressure on making sure that we're doing what we need to to, to bring on renewables and keep our nuclear plants open and the things that, that the other um, panelists have talked about. So I want to stay on coal for one more question. Um, we are expecting a new rule from EPA on CO2 emissions from existing plans, and that rule is going to task states with filing compliance plans. We don't yet know the specifics because the final rule isn't uh, out yet. It, it sounds from your remarks already that you're probably well on your way to being able to demonstrate uh, compliance. But I guess I'm just just wondering just sort of what, um, you know, you talked a lot about your existing 
approaches to this issue and your existing planning processes? Um, do you think that all of this stuff that you're already doing is going to sort of dovetail nicely with what's required uh, in the rule? Or are you expecting some new process to figure out how to how to comply? Um, and why don't we start here with Commissioner Paratic? Yeah, thanks, Ari. So you're going to get sick of me talking about planning, but that's really what the <laughs> what the answer is. Uh, but uh, I've been bearing the lead a little bit in the first few questions because because we had some really major and exciting new clean energy legislation that was passed in Michigan at the end of last year that we now it's our job to implement at the Public Service Commission. Um, and those laws are actually going to make us adjust these planning processes. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're doing that for this clean energy laws. Um, but th that could be expanded to the EPA rules when they when they finally come out as well um, and whatever those details are and I think that um you'll see that there's good there'll there'll be a lot of overlap so um our our landmark clean energy legislation did a, a few main things the first is that it established 100 percent clean energy standard by 2040 um it uh, increased renewable energy and energy waste reduction targets we call energy energy efficiency energy waste reduction in Michigan um for various reasons. Um, we uh, raised the cap on distributed generation. Um, it also created a new voluntary siting process for wind and solar to the MPSC. So to us, we that, that'll that be under our jurisdiction now. And it also included changes to our integrated resource planning process, which included, and, and in, so in addition to some, some other changes, it has new requirements for our integrated resource planning process that includes incorporation of equity, affordability, public health, and environmental impact on the approved integrated resource plan. It also sets up a few one-time initiatives for us at the Public Service Commission, including a study of our Upper Peninsula's energy resources, a proceeding to expand opportunities for engagement in commission proceedings, so how more people can actually get involved and have an influence over the decisions that we make. And it separately directs a process for the commission to consider processes for improving the rate case applications and review process. And again, a lot of that is focused on public input because it is so important to make sure that we're making these changes right. And the only way we can do that is if we uh, we get as many Im opinions and as much input from the from the public and the people who these decisions are actually affecting. So um, as far as contemplating a new EPA rule that will have impacts on fossil generation, our Michigan's planning process is, uh, you know, well set up to handle this and will uh, will uh, will uh, react in a similar way that we are now to this clean energy legislation. So we do coordinate closely with our our Department of Energy, Great Lakes and Environment. And our new energy legislation also increases the scale of that cooperation to an even greater degree. So it includes an, a, a deeper emphasis on environmental justice analysis, on climate and greenhouse gas emissions impacts, on affordability, and also on rate impacts. Um, so Ari, you told me I could get a little bit wonky in this discussion. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on how our IRP process will actually change as a result of these new energy laws. I'll be quick, though. Um, so uh, we're, we're planning on developing a red line version of our integrated resource planning parameters and also our the IRP filing requirements, as well as a straw proposal for incorporating those new requirements. And that's on our staff to put together. And then that'll all go out for public, uh, public input and public comment. And then we'll incorporate all of that and make those decisions. So using that existing process, we're just updating that to take on these new requirements. And then our staff is also directed to conduct a, a, two new engagement sessions with the public to address identification of EJ communities and an EJ analysis, projected long-term forecast of greenhouse gas emissions and other pollutants, projected rate and affordability impacts for the periods of the plan, cost effectiveness of the IRPs, any necessary updates to the environmental justice advisory opinion, and then also how to assure alignment of our renewable energy plans, energy optimization plans, and our integrated resource plans. We do a lot of planning here. Um, and then so and then we have an outline of uh, of those directives um, to to staff, and that's all included in uh, in our in one of our dockets. It's docket number two one five seven zero in case anyone wants to dive into that a little bit deeper. And if you want to follow along and provide public input, which we're always uh, always looking for for good comments and good public input, um you can follow that docket too. and uh, 
um, you'll you'll see uh, you'll be able to follow along with how we're changing everything in Michigan along the way. I, I can tell from the questions that are already in the Q and A that we have an extremely wonky audience, so I'm sure people appreciated that. Um, and you know, I wish I had sort of the legal authority to send you these written questions later and force you to answer them, but I feel fortunate that we just have this hour, so I'll try to get to some of the questions in a moment. But I want to stick stick with this issue of the EPA's forthcoming rule, and so let me turn to Keith on this one. Yeah, thank you, Ari, and and we'll agree with the commissioner on on planning, and and won't go deeper than that. But I think I'll make sort of two observations. You know, the first is that having looked at the the draft rules and and understanding where we are on a trajectory to the retirement of our coal plants and our emissions reductions you know we don't really see a significant impact on colorado especially from a reliability perspective you know given that that, that trajectory that we're on i think the other thing that we are watching and and looking to see where epa goes with this is really with respect to uh, the technologies in the forthcoming proposed rule, you know, the modeling that we've done on the clean energy pathways to, to 2040 here in Colorado uh, suggests strongly that some form of, you know, a firm dispatchable generation is going to help you help us get to an emissions reduction at the, at the lowest possible cost. And so, you know, thinking about things like clean hydrogen uh, and carbon capture, those may be really important tools to our utilities. Uh, to get to those really deep uh, emissions reductions. So we're certainly watching where that final rule lands on on some of those additional technologies. And Commissioner Sullen? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, um, I think that, and I, I'm just like Catherine, sorry if I'm a broken record here, but there's, there's, if we have enough road, if we have enough road in front of us, I'm not that worried about things because we have such a powerful and robust planning process. So I am, it, the thing that I worry about is sequencing of everything that needs to come together over the next five years, six years. That's what I worry more than anything. We have in Minnesota right now, we have seven trans, big transmission lines, 345 KV uh, and above lines that are in the process. Um, or about to be in the process, we have you know several power plants that are um, you know shutting down, and we have plans for like what replaces that energy. Thousands of megawatts of replacement energy that has to come online and has to be sequenced with those transmission lines. So that's what I worry about is the mechanics of 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 how this comes together. So we meet our targets, we meet our numbers. And, and at the end of the day, so that we keep a rely going, looping back to the first question, so that we keep that reliable system in place for Minnesotans and for our zone. That's really what I worry about. In terms of EPA, the rule itself, um, you know, I, it, it, for me, it, I, I'm not trying to be flip, but this is like, I, I think it's an example of, you know, a, a pound of, or an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Like, I feel like we've done the prevention where we planned and we're shutting our, you know, our older uh, emitting resources down. We're doing it quickly and we're replacing them with cleaner stuff so that it's going to Minnesotans are going to avoid, you know, the having to pay for the cleanup. So that's the way I look at this question. Here, Scott. Yeah, I'll be real quick. Um, I, I think based on what we did in the in the siege of bill, um, we, which involved an extensive uh, public process uh, and uh, and a stakeholder process, um, and because we've got not just a goal, but we've actually got the layout of how the plants uh, are expected to close and what timeline that's on, I would expect um, that with maybe the two exceptions of the of the uh, um, uh, to municipally owned plants where, you know, I think we, there are maybe some equivalency arguments we would need to make in terms of a state plan, but I feel like the the way CJA has set out what we're doing with the coal plants, uh, I, I don't see a, a, any kind of real compliance problem with the, with the federal rule. Um, I'm going to start to get into some of the issues that are in the, the Q and A and, um, you know, feel free to, you know, I'll just maybe just, just, um, if you don't have, if you you know, if you want to participate in these questions, feel free. If not, we don't have to go around the around the horn for everyone. So I want to start with um, activating consumers uh, and how consumers can be part of the solution rather than a problem here. So for decades, we've we've heard from economists that utility regulators should be setting prices that encourage 
efficient consumption, such as by incentivizing people to shift energy use to off-peak times. But I think in general, states have been slow to embrace those sorts of pricing plans and to allow consumers to play a meaningful role in improving the efficiency of the system. So how are you thinking about the role that consumer prices can play and what do you think states should be doing to motivate consumers to be more uh, efficient? If anybody wants to go first on that one, I have Commissioner Sullivan, if you want to start on that one or if else, happy to go elsewhere. Sure. No, I'm, I'm happy to start. I mean, I'm, I'm in general... You know, uh, in terms of uh, TOU rates, I think they work best when you have flexible load already, like an EV. You know, uh, those kind of investments, I'm I'm pretty comfortable with them. I'm I am worried about the impacts on. You know, we're seeing more heating load coming. I'm worried about TOUs when people rely on that for their source of heating. Um, you know, I'm cold now. <laughs> you know, I'm not cold at eight o'clock tonight. That kind of thing. Um, so I I am I am. I'm, I'm interested in TOU rates for sure. And we're in the process right now of, you know, we've, uh, all of our utilities have either pilots or they have TOU rates in place. Our co-ops have been really great. And we look to our co-ops as a source of innovation. Our co-ops and our munis, um, they do some really interesting, innovative stuff uh, with TOUs. One of the things that I, I, I think about a lot though is a, you know, we have a extremely effective conservation framework in Minnesota that makes people's bills more affordable. I mean, you know, I Minnesota's uh, conservation framework is saving the equivalent of 15% of the state's energy use. So like, I mean, it's a massive amount of energy that we save per year um, through our conservation framework. And that is what is really making people, the price of energy um, not as reflect, not reflected in the bill that they pay. So I, I'm a big believer in the power of uh, conservation frameworks that that flow through uh, the the utility and have the scale of a utility. Um, we we run really good conservation programs, and and that does make our bills more affordable. We have our rates in Minnesota are now kind of in the mid pack, uh, you know, nationally. But some of uh, bills for electricity um, are some of the lowest in the country for all of our utilities. So. Um, that's the way that I'm, I think about affordability. Maybe it's kind of an old fuddy duddy kind of the way my grandpa thought about it, but that, that is kind of the way that I, I, I do think about it. I'm interested in, in, in TOUs. I am interested in, in giving people access. Um, but at the end of the day, I kind of come back to these, in my view, kind of tried and true, like make sure that people are reducing the number of kilowatt hours that they're, they're, you know, that they're taking in every month. So. Commissioner Paratek, do you want to get in on this issue, please? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, I totally agree, Commissioner Sullivan. I really like your focus on conservation and energy efficiency and waste reduction. I think that's that's always a always a good thing. I will talk a little bit directly about TOU rates because we have in Michigan directed full TOU rates for our two largest utilities. Um, and we tested this out first via a, a pilot program, which included a couple different structures, a couple different methods for, for TOU, um, including an opt-in versus an opt-out program, um, and I, I think a few different levels of, uh, of price differentials as well. And then uh, after testing, we did order both of our two largest utilities to do full implementation of TOU rates for uh, exactly the reasons that you noted, Ari. We believe that incentivizing people to shift energy use to off-peak times encourages efficient consumption and will overall reduce the cost of electricity to customers, both from allowing them to shift their own usage, but also from reducing the use of and need to build any new peaking plants too. So um, we've seen some really good results. Uh, they've, this is relatively new. So we don't have the most robust data yet. Uh, our uh, consumers energy has, uh, their TOU rates have been in place since 2021. And for uh, DTE, it, it's only been in place since summer of 2023, so less than a year now. So we don't have um, a large amount of clean data yet. But for consumers that's been around for a few more years, we have seen a definitive drop in, in peak usage, even though we have a relatively small price differential. Um, but I think really importantly, we've seen an even larger drop in peak usage and a larger customer bill savings for low-income customers. 
Um, and I know that there's always concern about uh, about low income customers when it comes to TOU rates. And I absolutely share that concern. Lots of times lower income customers are less able to shift their their uh, their usage. Maybe they don't work a traditional nine to five job. They can't shift. It's it's sometimes more difficult or, you know, like like uh, Commissioner Sullivan, like you said, like I'm cold now. I need to run my my furnace or I'm hot now. I need to run my air conditioner right now, right in the middle of the day. Um, and they also have tend to have, uh, you know, less efficient homes too, which which even exacerbates that problem. But I will say, from the data that we have collected since 2021, um, we have seen a, a larger reduction from the lower income customers. And part of that, uh, getting into a little bit of the why, um, though in in Michigan at least, I, I don't know if this is true in other states, but I would suspect that it is. Lower income customers, on average, actually use more energy per month or and per day than the average residential customer. And higher usage customers actually benefit more from these TOU rates. More usage out occurs outside of those peak hours. So you're actually reducing your bill during those peak hours. That was that was a reduction in rate. Um, and it allows for more shifting of energy to the off-peak periods, shifting of more energy to off-peak periods. So um, we've seen that those are just some some statistics that we've uh, that we've been able to collect and analyze since 2021. I'm really looking forward to getting more of this and and seeing trying to dig a little bit deeper into this once we get uh, once we get more data. Um, but uh, you know, we I'm I'm excited at least about the the uh, the impact that we've seen so far. I would like to, well, if it's okay, I want to move on to another topic because we only have a few minutes left and there's just uh, a lot of questions. And a few questions have been about transmission. And I know three out of the four states here are part of multi-state, at least one multi-state regional transmission organization. And so I want to know what you think the state's role is in building out our transmission system, or is this something that should just be outsourced to PJM or MISO or one of the other RTOs? There was a mention earlier, I believe from Commissioner Sullivan about grid enhancing technologies. And so I'm curious, um, you know, where some of the values of these technologies are really in their implementation at the RTO level. And so what can states be doing to move forward on GETS? And then one more question again, feel free to address any one of these is, um, um, oh, I forgot the last one. So let's stick with with those two: the state's role in transmission development and uh, grid enhancing uh, technologies. I don't know if anyone wants to kick us off on this one. I, well, I can start on this sure. one if that's okay, Ari. Um, yeah. So we're heavily invested, as I know, uh, Catherine and Joe are in the the RTO processes. Uh, uh, we're uh, we're into Catherine is into RTOs and in Minnesota's. Uh, also into, although slightly different, uh, because they're in MISO and SPP. Um, so we're heavily involved in all of the processes at the RTO level. States don't have, uh, not a great shock to anyone on the call, uh, states don't have a great deal of authority or say so in the RTO process. So it really takes a lot of work to try to work with other states and try to tee up issues and try to make sure that the RTO is considering all of the issues that are important uh, to the states. Uh, recently, we did a letter with uh, uh, the OMS and, and, and OPSI people, those are the state organizations for MISO and PJM, uh, to try to work on interregional inter transmission, looking at how important that is, not just in, in kind of in, in everyday usage, but especially in times of some of the winter storm events that we've seen and some of the other uh, and some of the other issues that have come up. So we're really working on that, as well as I know um, we've talked about this, uh, I've talked about this with the other uh, the other panelists here, but talking about inter-tie um, inter optimization uh, between, uh, be, you know, between the, uh, between the RTOs. So all of these issues are things that I think it, the state role to that part of your question is that we just need to be really diligent and really involved in all of these in all of these processes at the RTO level because it's not necessarily that we're the people that they look to first. They'll look to us and they'll talk to us, but they they may not necessarily look to us first. And so it's really it's really incumbent on us to make sure that we're we're inserting ourselves uh, into all of these different processes. Anyone else on on transmission and sort of what states could be doing on gets and and what your role might be in a multi-state transmission planning process, Commissioner Sullivan? Yeah, I mean, I'll just say, I mean, I I kind of think of 
the question you have there on technology, what I'm excited about, transmission and regional partnerships, I'm I'm going to go for I'm going to swing for the fences here. Um, but I mean, I really what I'm excited about is transmission, because I do think that's that enabling technology for everything. And and if we can get it right with the regional partnerships, which I, I'm I sit on the organization of MISO states, um, you know, and collectively, yeah, we all have different you know, things that we agree about and disagree about. But I think we all do agree that the lowest cost uh, served energy is a good thing for um, our ratepayers in our states. Um, and if we can find that through line, if we can find that common denominator, you know, I, I'm excited about the technology that that will enable. I'm also excited about, I mean, I got into this because I care about climate, because I don't want to turn the earth into Venus. And I think that, you know, throughout the mid-continent, which is one of the largest sources of carbon emissions in the country and in, in the world, um, you know, MISO is projecting if you do tranche one, two, three, and four, that that would lead to a, basically a 95% carbon reduction, reduction throughout the mid-continent. So like transmission for me is that critical technology that we need to get right. And it involves regional partnerships. Uh, and anyways, so I'm swinging for the fences. I don't know if I hit it, but maybe at least a foul tip. Let me ask you a quick follow up on that then. Why, why do you think MISO has been more successful than other regions of the country in putting these plans together? Um, you know, I mean, I'll put in a, that's a good question. And I have not been in the other RTOs, so I don't really know their processes as much, but I can tell you what works really particularly well in MISO is I do think that MISO listens uh, to um, its stakeholders. And I think that MISO does try to find a common denominator amongst everybody, not just, it's not just a, you know, a TO club or a generator club or whatever. I think they do, they really do try to, to listen. I think that the organization of MISO states has been particularly effective and it's a plug for, for uh, new commissioner Hawkins um, in Wisconsin. I think he's done a particularly good job in, in getting us to really punch above our weight class. So I think there's a number of, of factors that, have been um, that have led to OMS's success. I mean, MISO's success. Uh, and um, I, I mean, I, I do think there's also a collaborative um, relationship that we have. You know, Minnesota and North Dakota, I think lo lots of folks would recognize that we don't always get along about certain things, but we work well together, you know. And I think that's made possible because of the forums and the personal relationships that we've created. And and also the structure of MISO, where it is, you know, we're all kind of, nobody has the final say. We all kind of have to come together. So at least that's my, say, it's my meanderings on it. So I, I agree with Joe. And I'd also say, Ari, that PJM now is starting to get to the point where MISO has been for a while in terms of looking at long range planning. And Catherine's been very involved in that. Um, I think it's more of, of a, I think MISO saw the need um a little bit quicker than pjm did i think pjm now is seeing that that this is something because of retirements and because of load growth and other things this is something that they have to get into and hopefully we'll get to the point on the pjm side where it's it's like joe describes it on the on the miso side but i'm sure Catherine has some thoughts on that as well we only have one minute left here. I can't get into all of those thoughts, but I I, I totally agree with that with everything that uh, that that both Doug and and Joe went through. I think there's a you know just a, a huge need for this and a huge need for coordination and um, listening to the state's perspectives. Having the RTOs actually listen to the state's perspectives is one of the 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 biggest um, uh, the biggest ways that we can get this right. I think, given that we're at the hour, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, I can't thank our four panelists enough for joining us, for sharing your expertise, and thank you all for your public service. I know this is, you do not have easy jobs, um, and we're facing certainly an interesting set of issues, and thank you again for uh, walking us through it. For those of you that are here in attendance, we will hopefully be posting this soon on the Harvard EELP uh, website. So thank you everyone for coming.